the mega content marketing ninja Jedi, smartest guy in the room, in a room full of content marketing people. So if you're interested in doing content marketing fun, that's fine. If you want to do it to grow your business, this is the only definition that matters. Content marketing is a marketing technique that uses content that you create that is valuable, relevant, it's consistently produced, and you're using it to attract and acquire customers, encourage them to drive a profitable customer action. So this is like the really, really important part, right? If you're in the business, uh, especially if you're in business for yourself, you're doing it because you love it, right? But you're also doing it because you've got an electricity bill and a mortgage to pay, kids to feed. So at the end of the day, whatever your passion is, there's gotta be a transaction there, right? So whatever we're going to do with content marketing, we have to know what we're trying to get people to do. So I'm going to break it down in seven steps, wrap it up at the end, and should have plenty of time for questions. Real quick, this is what marketing, content marketing isn't. <laughs> it is not your brochure. It's not even your website. It's not ads. It is not selling. It is not sales. Content marketing should support you know, what you do for sales. It should drive sales. But it is not sales. You're not selling when you're doing it. All right. So to work off that definition, we'll make sure that we have to define what our action is, provide value, and then profit. First things first. So the definition mentioned that you're writing, you're creating content for a clearly defined audience. Right? Every person is a unique snowflake. And you, and you, and you, all special. But thankfully, the people that are doing business with you, the people who will do business with you in the future, there is some overlap. There are analogies <coughs> among them, uh, whether they're attracted to your product or just the way that you present yourself. There's something in common. Those kind of overlap bubble people, we call those personas. And a persona is a fictional person that stands kind of as a placeholder for your customer. And it is the person that you're going to talk to when you're creating your content. Now, depending on what your product or service is, you might just have one persona, right? You carve teeth, fake teeth. Your persona is a guy who is a dentist or runs a dental lab. That's it. Well, not a lot of variety there. Be doing a lot of different things. Um, there might be six, there might be eight. The point is that you come up with a minimum useful number so that you can craft messages that will reach those people specifically instead of trying to reach everybody in the room. So personas can actually get very detailed and there are marketing consultants that make a living of just doing personas. So, but you don't really need that. You can just talk to your current customers talk to people who might be potential customers and find out who are they, what do they really want, what are they afraid of, <coughs> what are they having a hard time with, and how can you help? So a great example is, let's say you have a landscaping service and your name is just lawns. Well, you do. You don't do any fancy walls, you don't deal with flowers, you don't clean up gutters, just lawns. That's it. So your customer, your potential customer, is somebody who has a lawn of their own that they're responsible for maintaining, right? People in apartments, condos, and homeowners, don't matter. They also have the disposable income to pay for somebody to mow their lawn, right? So maybe it's Joe Business. Joe's 45 years old, he's an executive, he's very, very successful, works a lot of hours, beautiful house in the suburbs, loves his wife, loves his two kids, doesn't have a lot of time with them. In fact, anything that doesn't support his career or family is a nuisance. He hates to about that stuff. What if he could just forget about having to mow his lawn? Your service is all about just mowing lawns. He's the perfect customer. Maybe you have a service offering that's like, forget about it. Pay us a flat fee every quarter, we'll come over your lot on a schedule. Right? That's your persona. 
he fits the bill. So you can get much more detail. You can estimate the level of income. You can um, estimate personality traits. You can even use quotes from your customers as a reference for how this person thinks. But the, doing this exercise is what helps you get out of your own shoes and step into theirs where you're creating content. Because again, you're not going to be selling. So it's not about you. The next layer is the sales funnel. Have you guys ever seen this before? Good. <laughs> well, if you're in corporate B2B like me, you see this all the time, but it actually applies to everything. Um, it doesn't always take this shape, but this one's really easy to remember. So this is the sales funnel. Tofu is top of the funnel. Mofu is middle of the funnel. Bottoms. Oh, funnel. So this is basically talking about the stages that a buyer goes through when considering a product. So uh, Jeff here is a career coach. I'm going to pick on him. The first stage is awareness. You might not be in the market for a career coach, but you know that there's such a thing and it sounds interesting. So you might be browsing around. If you're creating content for that stage of the buying journey, you might write things like, what is career coaching? What makes a good career coach? Will career coaching help you find a job? This is really, really early in the stage. As you move down into awareness consideration, you become one of several viable options. So now they're in a different stage. Now, they know they want to commit to a transaction with someone or something. It might not necessarily be you, right? So, it could be other career coaches, could be other options. You could write content that answers questions like, is career coaching a better investment than a degree? What is the return on investment of career coaching? You see what I'm saying? So, the questions are different. We're not, we already know what career coaching is if we're in the middle of the funnel. We need to know what's our, what's our best option here. By the time they're a little further down and they're getting really serious, it might be between you and, and another option, you've got to make it really easy. This is kind of where objection handling happens. So to take it back a step, personas are not just your customers. Personas are people who can make a referral to your business or influence your customer, right? If you're a college age student and you're looking to pick a college, you're not really, you're, you're technically the customer, but your parent is an influencer. Or if you have a child that's looking at a college, you're the influencer. You, you have veto power, right? So once we're in this stage, and Jeff really wants to make it easy for somebody to do business with him, he could produce a checklist how to prove to your spouse that career coaching for just you is a great investment for both of you. So see what happens? It's like you prepare the person to handle any objections with influencers and give them more confidence about the validity of the decision, the buying decision they're about to make. So once you figure out who you're talking to and that you need to reach them at different points in your journey, the next thing is figure out what to write about. And in some cases, it's really easy. And in some cases, it's really hard. So let's say that you sell your artwork on Etsy, right? Well, can you write about your artwork every day? Probably not. Can you write about, I want to paint, maybe. But what's, what's the valuable thing that you can do? What's the benefit that you promise? If you're trying to sell artwork, what are people getting out of it? You're making the home beautiful. You are giving them a way to express their appreciation for art. It's like high up there, you know, self-actualization stuff. Like they get to feel interesting and cosmopolitan. They found this beautiful piece of artwork online. How do you feed into that? So some of the themes you could write about would be like how to shop around. You know, with small independent artists. How to safely ship artwork overseas. How to know 
He bought that artwork. <laughs> the point is to find things that are related to what they're trying to accomplish. I mean, tip song, you know, how do you, how do you hang three different pieces of artwork in the same room without them starting a fight? That kind of thing. Think about what your customer is going to get out or expect out of the transaction and write around those themes. So, um, I, the company I work for, we sell web, web content management software. So we could write about web content management, but that's not why our customers buy it. They buy it to do other things. They buy it because they want to do content marketing, or because they have a major web project, or they need to do a website redesign. So guess what we write about? We write about content marketing, website design, and web projects to make it easier for them. You know, it's an opportunity for you to be helpful, credible, and actually learn more about your customer and your business, which is always a good thing. So the next step, once you sorted out who you're talking to, what you're going to talk about, and um, you want to see where you want to put your content. So I put blogs at the top, and that's kind of non-negotiable. I write lots of blog posts every week for work. If you go to my blog, it hasn't been updated in a while. It's kind of the case of the cobbler's children having their shoes. <laughs> you never have time for your stuff. Um, but it's, it's, it's super critical. Your, your website is not, oh cool, I have a website. It is, it is a hub. It's a way for you to, to be found. It's really important. And if you just set it and forget it, Google will forget it too. Um, everything you do should drive people back to your website. That's where they can find how to contact you, learn more about your business. Blog posts are a great way to regularly produce fresh content, which Google loves. And then over time, there's a cumulative effect. Because the more there is, the more there is for search engines to index. There's also more for potential customers to see, kind of dig into it. Wow, look at all these great blog posts. I'm probably going to you know, spend a half hour on your website reading all of them. The other options are research papers, white papers. You might have downloaded one in the past. You might have no idea what it is. That's OK. Um, videos, podcasts. It doesn't have to be written content. If your comfort level or your customer is better suited listening to podcasts in the car, do it. You know, if something that you do is really technical, create how-to videos. Um, if you're an artist, you can do a video series for teaching your kids how to paint animals. Right? It's all content. It's all helpful. It's all really good. You know, ebooks, newsletters, email newsletters are great. But depending on your customer, it doesn't have to be electronic. Um, magazines, uh, I don't know how many of your big on the DIY home stuff, but Lowe's and Home Depot are like kicking ass at content marketing. They are so good. You cannot walk in there and not see books. They have leaflets for different types of DIY projects. They have blogs on their websites. There's always instructional videos. Now they all like have a small army of content people, mm. but it's a great inspiration for what can be done, you know. And this all happens before anybody buys anything, but that's what gets people's attention in the first place. Also, slide decks, conferences, webinars, different ways to produce content. So, in terms of providing value, this is again circling back to step out of your shoes, step into your persona's shoes. It's not about how great you are, it's about what they need and what you can do for them. So don't sell, help. If you don't think you have ideas, I bet you've got 1,500 different questions that you've been asked by a customer about what you do about your business. Every question can be a blog post. Ten questions make a guide. You can recycle that stuff too. Content marketing is very green. Everything's reusable. Um, especially if you find that on your blog you're writing about one kind of thing over and over, turn it into an ebook, elaborate, and then make it something that's downloadable. You know, if you have a product, your goal is to tell them how to succeed with it before they buy it. It's all about empowering the customer to make an informed buying decision. Whatever you do, whether 
have you as a real estate agent, a coach, <coughs> they want to walk away feeling like, I did something really smart today. I made a lot of good decisions. I made a great investment. Not, damn it, I was sold to a debt. You know, that's not how they want to feel. That looks like a bad taste in their mouths. So they feel empowered. If you're giving them more information, if it leads them to another business, you know, that's competition. That happens. If it happens that what you do stinks, the content's not going to cover for that. But if your stuff is really good, and you make a really strong promise early on and are able to deliver on it, you're going to have not just a customer, but an evangelist later on. And they will produce content on your behalf. It's also about building credibility. The fact <coughs> is, if people are going to give you money, they want to know that you know what you're doing. Right? They don't want to feel like you're a fly-by-night operation in your garage, just set up the other day, and producing a lot of content on your area of expertise, which you already have because you're in business, gives you a lot of credibility and trust over time. This is the really important part. I don't know how many of you know this guy. Walter White, chemistry teacher turned prod prodigy meth cook. Makes the best meth in the world. I don't know if you've heard, 97% pure. It's like unheard of. And it's blue. So what? He's small potatoes. Why? He doesn't have a distribution plan. So he finds another drug lord who has distribution in place all the way down into Mexico. Now he's in the big leagues. Yeah. Not because he was making good stuff to begin with, but because he found a way to distribute it to the right people through effective channels. So. Unfortunately, your website is the hub of your business. Well, that's not unfortunate. But unfortunately, if people don't know you, they don't know you. So you want to lead them back to your website. But a lot of them won't start there, so you have to get found elsewhere. That's why social media is so important, right? When you share something on Twitter, on Facebook, Google+, Plus, yes, people use it. Um, it's more likely to be seen by somebody in your network who finds it relevant We'll share it with somebody else who thinks it's relevant. So you can't do content marketing without social. Um, and you can't really do social effectively without content to share, unless you're going to do a lot of navel gazing um, and selfies, which does not count as content marketing unless you're from Kardashian. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing is open publishing platforms. So LinkedIn recently opened up publishing platform they used to only allow influencers like really big name CEO people um, now anybody who's on LinkedIn can publish and it's sort of like a blog that gives you a lot more visibility gets you into people who aren't typically in your network and there's an editorial team so if you're writing on a useful subject and the quality is good the editorial team might even feature your content this actually happened to me I got like 1,200 views in four days on a blog post to that on my company website. What's the name of that blog post? LinkedIn. No, no, but did you mention the name of the open publishing platform? Yeah, you think that's it? Just yep. LinkedIn? Oh, I thought they were putting out. Yep. Oh, well, they bought this thing called Pulse and integrated it, but really it's just if you have a LinkedIn account, oh, okay. you have a On my company website, it did not get this many views, I can tell you that. So having that extra channel made a huge difference. And it'll be a lot of exposure. Um, Medium is another great one. Have you guys heard of Medium? It's sort of like an open blog. It's for medium to um, long form content. And anybody can create an account, a uh, content group, right on any subject you want. But there's also a lot of editors who scout and look for good content. And if, and if your content is good, people will recommend it. And they'll share it to Twitter, even if they don't know you. It's amazing. And it's called Medium? Medium, yeah. And um, on LinkedIn, um, when you're saying you're publishing, what, what is the format of that? It looks like a, like a blog post or like a news post. So it'll show up on your profile, and it'll show up in the um, feeds of anybody who you're linked to. But you can also share it, and it's, um, they can leave comments there. 
I can pull it up after the presentation. Yeah, I'd, I'd be like, interested to see that. Sure, you can do that. Excuse me. published right within LinkedIn as opposed to just sharing a link to it. So that just happened within the past two months. Oh. It's relatively new. Oh. And they rolled it out gradually, but by now everybody should have access. So it also gives, that's another like, it, it gives you more credibility mm -hmm. to be there. Because the first people to publish on LinkedIn were the Richard Bransons of the world, were the influencers and the big names. Mm -hmm. So if you're in there, you're already a really good company. It's a it's great encouragement to kind of step up your, your game. So you can also gain followers on LinkedIn that way now, instead of just direct connections. So people can see the content that you share. Oh, I'm sorry. So the difference before was that when you posted something, it wasn't a land issue. When you posted something, it went to the people who followed you. Right. Now it could be anybody. Yeah. Okay. Is that but I'll show you, I'll show you later. All right. And I'll illustrate it illustrate it better. Um, industry websites are good. Um, so if you're in again, just real estate, there might be a community that you can write content for. If you're in house painting, there might be a form that you could post for. Again, five different channels. And then the last piece is you can actually distribute other people's mm -hmm. content, which is huge, because mm -hmm. you don't have to write it. It's called curation. Because you've heard content marketing a lot. So a lot of people are doing it. Not everybody's doing it well. So there's this flood of content now. But where's the good stuff? Curation is, listen, you don't have to look. Get off Google, I found the good stuff for you. Right here. Best three articles I could find on career coaching. Forget the other stuff. This is another way of providing value. You're providing a service here. You're saving them the time from looking for the information you desperately need. So, let's put it all together. Seven steps, right here. Know what you're trying to accomplish. So, if you have an Etsy or eBay store, you're trying to make a sale happen. It's pretty straightforward. But maybe you want people to sign up for a consultation. Come to an open house. Sign up for your newsletter. Download an ebook so that you've got their email and you can continue, continue to market for them. Decide what that profitable customer action is. Page views are great, social shares are awesome. What you really want is the stuff that's eventually going to lead to a sale happening. Because you gotta make a living. And this, defining that early on too, helps you measure the effect of this, effectiveness of what you're doing. You might realize, you know what? My blog posts are falling flat. They're not really driving sales at all. But when I did a video, it went bananas. I'm going to do videos now. You know who you're trying to reach. So again, it's that persona. Take off your shoes. Step into theirs. What do they want? What's bothering them? Help me out. Understand their buying process. Is it too soon to the, talk to them about committing? Okay. Just help them about the landscape. Are they further along and comparing different options? Now's the time to help them explore, all right, what makes product X good? You know, how do you know you've bought a good lawnmower? Ten things to look for. Further down the, further down the funnel. Pick your themes. So again, how does what you do fit into the bigger picture of the way your customer is going to succeed with your product or service right around that cloud. Create content that's helpful, valuable, informative, credible. Don't steal other people's content. Give credit where it's due. Don't make things up. And then distribute like you're the biggest meth dealer New Mexico has ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, real quick, I'm just going to pull up what you're pulling up on the incredible. I recently had a situation on Facebook where one of my daughter's friends from school had posted something that the blog owner had given credit to a particular photographer. And I had said, made a comment, oh, small world. The photographer shown here is, you know, at so-and-so on my Facebook. And 
he'd never given permission for use of the photos. It was copyrighted content. You know, giving credit's great. You make sure you have permission. Yeah, yeah, don't yeah. do that. A um, yeah. good way to filter is if you need images, both Flickr and Google Image Search now allow you to select things that are licensed for commercial use that you can license for com use commercially without paying. And of course, there's paid services like iStock Photo and Shutterstock. Um, yeah, don't be that guy. Because um, those folks are making a living too. Okay, so um, there's another reason why it's important to be on other platforms. I wrote the same blog post for my company post, wrote my company website, and then I put it on LinkedIn. Guess which one's got more SEO juice? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Same goes for medium, same goes for industry websites. This is why, if you can, it's important to find other channels to distribute. You're benefiting from their credibility a little bit, so obviously don't take advantage of it and produce bad content. But the little bit of SEO fairy dust. Did you just repost the same exact thing? Mm -hmm. And I just made a note that this post originally appeared elsewhere, but made a huge difference. Looks like I've got some LinkedIn. And they've got I'm just thinking that's, <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know what? I'm a liar because this is not the LinkedIn one. Here we go. Here's, so the LinkedIn one appeared higher. So this is it. This is what an article on LinkedIn looks like. How did you get it there? Where did you go to post it? There's, it's, it's on, it's when you log in, you'll see when it. When you log in, it'll, it'll show you the option. I would tell you exactly where it is, except that the LinkedIn navigation is so convoluted that I have to look for it. Yeah. I to do it. And I've done it. So, okay, now I'm up to over 3,200 views. I can tell you nothing I've ever done in my life has gotten that many views. Wow. Um, that's and this awesome. only went up in February, so it's less than two months old. Mm -hmm. So that's huge. People can like it, view it, share it, comment on it right from LinkedIn. Here you go. Wow. So they're very, very engaged. Got a lot of shares. And. These people who aren't connected to you any other way now, they can follow you so that when we produce a post in the future, they will see it. Mm -hmm. And this also got, yeah, this got featured on the social media board. So there's different channels on LinkedIn. So before, oh. if you decide to publish there, look at what's around and think about how can I provide something that will fit well to those channels and is good fodder for those editors. How do you how do you find out what those other channels are? You go to <clears throat> you know, I'll have to log in. But when you first log in mm -hmm. and you see your feed at the very top, it might say Pulse has recommendations for you. Oh yeah, yeah. Click on there and that'll be the other different channels and the influencers you can follow. Oh, so this is that Pulse thing that was mm -hmm. was. Yeah. Pulse was a content curation platform, and LinkedIn bought it. So, and the reason that they did, this is actually a really good post, if I may say so myself, so mm -hmm. I recommend reading it, <laughs> oh, why curation is important, why mm -hmm. LinkedIn invested in it. LinkedIn was like this totally unsexy Rolodex, right? Mm -hmm. This online Rolodex, and you signed up for it, and then you forgot your password, and then you have to reset your password and get it again, because your aunt emailed you, and she's like, can you go back to LinkedIn? And then you forget it again. Um, by having a lot of really great curated content, they're giving you a reason to visit their website daily, not just when you get fired and are looking for a job. <laughs> <laughs> it's made all the difference for them, right? Because you're not looking for a job every day unless you really, really, really hate your job. And you're not seeing what people are, you know, from your last job are doing every day. But you're interested in news in your industry. So having content, that gives you a reason to go back here. And because people have a reason to go back here, it's a really good place to be.